Welcome back to season two of Midwest Covencast Presents Weekend Reads. I'm Marilyn of Midwest Covencast. Here in the second half of season two, we will be making our way through book three of Heinrich Cornelius Agrippa's Three Books of Occult Philosophy or Magic, which explores ceremonial magic. You can find podcast extras for this season and more at MidwestCovenCast.com. I hope you enjoy this week's installment. Chapter 59 of Sacrifices and Oblations, and Their Kinds and Manners. A sacrifice is an oblation which is both holy by offering, and sanctifies and makes holy the offerer, unless either irreverence or some other sin be an impediment to him. Therefore, these sacrifices and oblations do yield us much hope, and make us of the family of God, and do repel us many evils hanging over our heads, which the doctors of the Hebrews do especially confirm, saying by this that we kill our living creatures, and dissipate our wealth by sacrifice. We turn away mischiefs, which do hang over us, for as this mortal priest sacrifices in this inferior world the soul of irrational creatures to God, by the separating of the body from the soul, so Michael the archangel, the priest of the higher world, sacrifices the souls of men, and this by the separation of the soul from the body, and not of the body from the soul, unless perchance, as it happens, in fury, rapture, ecstasy, and sleep, and such like vacations of the soul, which the Hebrews call the death of the body. But sacrifices and oblations are first of all, and principally, to be offered up to the Most High God. But when they are to be directed to the secondary divine powers, this ought to be done even as we have spoken concerning prayers and vows. But there are many kinds of sacrifices— one kind is called a burnt offering, when the thing sacrificed was consumed by fire. Another is an offering for the effusion of blood. Moreover, there are salutiferous sacrifices, which are made for the obtaining of health. Others pacifying for obtaining peace. Others praising for the freeing from some evil, and for the bestowing of some good thing. Others gratulatory for divine worship and thanksgiving. But some sacrifices are made neither for the honor of God, nor out of good will, of which sort was that amongst the Hebrews called the sacrifice of jealousy, which was made only for the detecting of occult adultery. There was in times past amongst the Gentiles the sacrifice of expiation, by the which cities were purged from famine, pestilence, or some horrible calamity, whose rites were to search out the most wicked man in the city, and to lead him to the place appointed, carrying in his hands a cheese and wafers and dry figs, afterwards to whip him seven times with rods, and then to burn him to ashes with the same rods, and to cast the ashes into the sea. Of these, Lycophron and Hipponax make mention, Neither doth Philostratus relate things much different from these, concerning Apollonius of Tyana, while he chased away the pestilence from Ephesus. Moreover, there were many kind of sacrifices and offerings, as Agonalia, Dapsa, Feriadionis, Hecatome, Hostia, Hyacinthia, Armelustra, Genulia, Lacalia, Lupercalia, Munichia, Novendinalia, Nictaluca, Palatialia, Pastellaria, Popularia, Protervia, Sinopesia, Solitorialia, Stata, Rubigalia, Fontanalia, Ormia, Parentalia, Inferi, Consuelia, Lamteria, Amberbia, Ambarvalia, Vivalia, Thaya, Holocaustumata, Orgia, Thesmophoria, Adonia, Tionia, Laurentialia, Opalia, Pelilia, Quirnelia, Vertumnalia, Gynacia, Panthania, Quincordia, Deapalia, Diasia, Horma, Hormea, Nemia, Mitriaca, Pelogigia, and the offerings of these were proper and diverse, for a goat and an ass were sacrificed to Bacchus, a sow to Ceres, and horse to the sun and heart, and dogs to Diana, 
an ass to Priapus, a goose to Isis, a dunghill cock to the night, a she-goat to Faunus, a bull to Neptune, a she-goat to Minerva, a bull to Hercules, a child to Saturn, a sow with pigs to Maha, a cock to Asclepius. Moreover, they did sacrifice to Hercules Nidius with scolding and railings. There were also diverse orders of priests as high priests, flamens, archiflamens, phylades, salians, hierophants, and diverse names of religions and superstitions and sacrifices, ceremonies, feasts, consecrations, dedications, vows, devotions, expiations, oaths, offerings, satisfactory works, by the which the seduced Gentiles did sacrifice to false gods and devils, but the true sacrifice which purges any man and unites him to God is twofold, one which the high priest Christ offered for the remission of sins, purifying all things by the blood of his cross, the other by the which a man offers up himself clean, unspotted for a living sacrifice to God." as Christ, the high priest, offered himself, and taught us to be offered together with him, as he was offered, saying of the sacrament of his body and blood, Do this in remembrance of me, viz., that we should offer ourselves together, being mortified by the passion of his mortal body, and quickened in spirit, of the which Porphyry said, Let us labor to offer up holiness of life for a sacrifice, for no man can be a good priest of God, but he which brings forth himself for a sacrifice, and builds up his own soul, as it were, for an image, and doth constitute both his mind and understanding for a temple, in the which he may receive the divine light. But eternal sacrifices, as Herclitus said, are certain cures of the soul, instituted by the most high physician, for the evil spirit possesses a man, as Proclus said, even until he be expiated by sacrifices. Therefore, sacrifices are required to pacify God and the heavenly powers, and to expiate a man who bears the image both of God and the world. But our Lord Jesus Christ, the true high priest, concluded all sacrifices in bread and wine only, as in the primary substance of man's meat, needing further the offering up of no animals, nor other things, or the effusion of blood, in which we may be cleansed, and being perfectly cleansed in his blood. There were also amongst the Egyptians six hundred sixty-six kinds of sacrifices, for they did appoint divine honors and holy sacrifices to each star and planet, because they were divine animals partaking of an intellectual soul and a divine mind, whence they say that the stars being humbly prayed unto do hear our prayer and bestow celestial gifts, not so much by the natural agreement as by their own free will, and this is that which Iamblichus said, that celestial bodies and the deities of the world have certain divine and superior powers in themselves, as also natural and inferior, which Orpheus calls the keys to open and shut, and that by those who are bound to the fatal influences, but by these to lose us from fate, whence if any misfortune hang over any one from Saturn or from Mars, the magicians command that he must not forthwith fly to Jupiter or Venus, but to Saturn or Mars themselves, to that Apulian Psyche, who was persecuted by Venus for equaling her in beauty, was forced to importune for favor, not from Ceres or Juno, but from Venus herself. Now they did sacrifice to each star with the things belonging to them, to the sun with solary things and its animals, as a laurel tree, a cock, a swan, a bull, to Venus with her animals, as a dove or turtle, and by her plants, as vervain, as Virgil sings, water bring out, with garlers soft, the altar round about, compass and burn fat boughs, and frankincense, that's strong and pure." moreover the magicians when they made any confection either natural or artificial belonging to any star this did they afterward religiously offer and sacrifice to the same star receiving not so much a natural virtue from the influence thereof being opportunely received as by that religious oblation receiving it divinely confirmed and stronger for the oblation of anything, when it is offered to God, after a right manner, that thing is sanctified by God, by the oblation, as is a sacrifice, and is made part thereof. 
Moreover, to the celestial and ethereal gods, white sacrifices were offered, but to the terrestrial or infernal, black. But to the terrestrial upon the altars, but to the infernal in ditches, to the aerial and watery flying things, but to these white, to those black. Finally, to all the gods and demons, besides terrestrial and infernal, flying things were offered, but to those only four-footed animals, for like rejoices in like. Of these only which were offered to the celestial and ethereal, it is lawful to eat, the extreme parts being reserved for God, but of the other not. Now all these the oracle of Apollo hath expressed in these verses. A threefold sacrifice of the gods above, white must be slain for them, for them below, threefold also, but black for them, withal with open altars, gods celestial, are taken when the infernal gods require, pits and brood with black blood and filled with mire, and are not pleased but with a sacrifice that's buried, but of the air the deities delight in honey, and in wines most clear, and that on altars kindled be the fire, require with flying sacrifice and white, but of the earth the deities delight, that earthly bodies should with frankincense and wafers offered be in reverence. But for the gods that rule the sea thou must, thy sacrifices lay on the sea coasts, and on the waves cast the whole animal, but to the deities celestial, give the extreme parts, and them consume with fire, what then remains thou mayest, if thou desire." Eat up and let the air with vapors thick and sweet smelling drop. These doth Porphyry make mention of in his book of answers, to whom the rest assent, for they say that these sacrifices are certain natural mediums between the gods and men, which Aristotle affirming said that to sacrifice to God is in a man naturally. They are therefore, they say, mediums which favor of the nature of both, and represent divine things analogically, and have with the deity to whom they are offered certain convenient analogies, but so occult that a man's understanding can scarce conceive of them, which God and the deities require, in particular, for our expiation, with which the celestial virtues are pleased, and withhold themselves from execution of the punishment which our sins deserve, and these are, as Orpheus calls them, keys which open the gate of the elements and the heavens, that by them a man may ascend to the super-celestials, and the intelligences of the heavens, and the demons of the elements may descend to him. Now men that are perfect and truly religious need them not, but only they, who, said Trismegistus, being fallen into disorder, are made the servants of the heavens and creatures, who, because they are subjected to the heavens, therefore think they may be corroborated by the favor of the celestial virtue, until they, flying higher, be acquitted from their presidency, and become more sublime than they. Chapter 60 what imprecations and rites the ancients were wont to use in sacrifices and oblations. Now let us see what imprecations they did join to oblations and sacrifices, for he that did offer any sacrifice to God did say these, or the like things, I thy servant do offer, and sacrifice these things to thee. I confess that thou art the author of all sanctity, and I call upon thee to sanctify this oblation, that thou wouldst pour upon it the virtue of thy high and excellent spirit, that by it we may obtain that we ask for. Moreover, also, as this thing present by any oblations is made thine, as to live or die to thee, so also let me be made thine, who by this oblation and communion, by this thing which I come to offer and sacrifice to thee, profess to be one of thy family and worshippers. Besides in offerings, it was said, as that animal is in my power to be slain, if I pleased, or to be saved, so it is in thy power to take away in wrath, or to give in love that which we desire. Lastly, when for expiation, or the avoiding of any evil, any sacrifice was to be made, it was said, as that animal dies in my hand, so die all vice in me. Also all uncleanness, or so let die, and be annihilated, such or such an evil or discommodity. Also, as the blood of this animal is poured forth out of its body, so let all vice and uncleanness flow out from me, 
in sacrifices laid on the altar to be burnt. It was said, as this oblation is consumed by this present fire, so that nothing remains of it, so let all evil be consumed in me. Let such or such an evil, which we would repel and avoid be consumed. It was also a custom, when imprecation was made, to touch the altar with the hands of all those for whom which a sacrifice was made, or of them who did desire to be partakers of it, because prayer only cannot prevail, unless he that prays touches the altar with his hands. Whence in Virgil, those that in these words pray and altar touch, the omnipotent doth hear. And elsewhere, I touch the altars and the middle fires and the deities beseech. Chapter 61. How these things must be performed as to God, so as to inferior deities. Every adoration, therefore, oblation or sacrifice, deprecation, invocation, are differenced thus, viz., either because they are made to God only, or to inferior deities, as angels, stars, heroes. In these, therefore, such rules are to be observed, that when any prayer is to be offered to God alone, for the obtaining of any effect, it must be done with the commemoration of some work miracle, sacrament, or promise taken somewhere out of scripture, as if there be a deprecation made for the destruction of enemies, let it be commemorated that God destroyed the giants and the deluge of waters and the builders of Babel. In the confusion of tongues, Sodom and Gomorrah, in raining of fire, the host of Pharaoh in the Red Sea, and the like, adding to those some malediction out of the Psalms, or such as may be gathered out of other places of Scripture. In like manner, when we are to deprecate against dangers of waters, let us commemorate the saving of Noah in the flood, the passing of the children of Israel through the Red Sea, and Christ walking dry-shod upon the waters, and saving a ship from shipwreck, commanding the winds and waves, and lifting up Peter, sinking in the waves of the sea, and such like. But if a prayer be necessary for obtaining oracles or dreams, whether it be to God, angels, or heroes, there are many places offer themselves out of the Old Testament, where God is said to talk with men, promising in very many places, presages, and revelations, besides the prophetical dreams of Jacob, Joseph, Pharaoh, Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar in the Old Testament, and the revelation of John, Paul in the New, also of holy magicians as Helen, Constantine, and Charles, also of later prophets as Methodius, Cyrilius, Joachim, Merlin, Brigida, Mactindus, Hildegardus, the deities of whom, being piously invocated, render us oftentimes partakers of divine revelations. Moreover, we must invocate the sacred names of God, but those especially which are significative of the thing desired, or any way applicable to it. As for the destruction of enemies, we must invocate the name of God's wrath, of the revenge of God, fear of God, justice of God, fortitude of God, but for the avoiding of any danger, we must invocate the names of pity, defense, salvation, goodness, and the like. Moreover, we must petition for and to the effectors of the thing desired, viz. such an angel, star, or hero, on whom that office lies, but observing that our invocation on them must be made with due number, weight, and measure, and according to the rules delivered concerning enchantments, for between these there is no difference, but that enchantments are such as affect our mind, disposing the passions thereof into a conformity to certain deities. But prayers are such as are exhibited by any deity by way of worship and veneration, and from the same root also may the manner of consecrations be taken, of which we shall in the next place speak. Chapter 62 Of Consecrations and Their Manner Consecration is lifting up of experiments by which a spiritual soul, being drawn by proportion and conformity, is infused into the matter of our works according to the tradition of magical art, rightly and lawfully prepared, and our work is vivified by the spirit of understanding. The efficacy of consecrations is perfected by two things, especially, viz., the virtue of the person himself consecrating, and the virtue of the prayer itself. In the person himself is required holiness of life and a power to consecrate, 
the former nature and desert perform. The latter is acquired by imitation and dignification, of which we have spoken elsewhere. Then it is necessary that he that sacrifices must know this virtue and power in himself with a firm and undoubted faith. Now what things are required in prayer are these. There is also a certain power of sanctifying placed in it by God, as if it be so ordained of God for this or that very thing, of which sort we read of many in the Holy Writ, or instituted to this or that thing, by the virtue of the Holy Ghost, according to the ordination of the Church, of which sort are many everywhere extant. Or this holiness is in the prayer itself, not by virtue of institution, but of the commemoration of sacred things, as of sacred letters, histories, miracles, works, effects, favors, promises, sacraments, and such sacramental things, which shall seem to cohere with the thing to be consecrated either properly or improperly or analogically. And of these we shall now give some examples, by which a way easily may be laid open to the whole consideration of it. So in the consecrating of water there is this commemoration made, these, because God placed the firmament in the middle of waters, because in the middle of the earthly paradise he made a holy fountain, from which, through four rivers, the whole earth is watered, because he made the waters an instrument of his justice. In the destruction of the giants, by the general deluge over the whole earth, and in the destruction of the army of Pharaoh in the Red Sea, and because he led the people dry-shod through the middle of the Red Sea and through the middle of Jordan, and because he brought water miraculously out of a rock of the wilderness, and brought forth a fountain of living water out of the jawbone of an ass at the prayers of Samson, and because he appointed the waters as an instrument of his pity and of salvation for remission of sins." And because Christ, being baptized in Jordan, purified and sanctified the waters, and the like also by invocating divine names suitable to these things, as when God is called a living fountain, living water, a living river, in like manner, in consecration of fire, let there be a commemoration that God created the fire to be an instrument of his justice for punishment, revenge, purgation of sins, and when he comes to judge the world, he will command burning to go before. And he appeared to Moses in a burning bush, went before the children of Israel in a pillar of fire, and commanded that inextinguishable fire should be kept in the tabernacle of the covenant, and kept fire unextinguished under the water. Also, we must use such divine names as offer themselves, as because God is a consuming fire, and a melting fire, and such are proper to these as the shining of God, the light of God, the brightness of God, and such like. So in the consecration of oil, such solemnities must be commemorated as belong to these, as in Exodus, the oil of unction and sweet perfumes, and sacred names suitable to these, such as is the name Christ, which signifies anointed, and such as this, and that in the Apocalypse concerning the two olive trees, distilling sanctified oil into lamps, burning in the presence of God. So in the consecration of places, let there be commemoration made of Mount Sinai, of the tabernacle of the covenant, of the sanctum sanctorum, the temple of Solomon, and of the sanctification of the hill Golgotha, through the mystery of the passion of Christ, and the field which was bought with the price of Christ's blood also of Mount Tabor, where the transfiguration and ascent into heaven was, sacred names also being used as the place of God, the throne of God, the chair of God, the tabernacle of God, the altar of God, the seat of God, and the habitation of God, and of such like. After the same manner, we must proceed in the benediction of other things by inquiring into holy writ by divine names and profession of religion for such things which may seem to be after a manner suitable to this or that thing, as for example, if there be a paper or a book having some of the mysteries which we should commemorate as the tables of the Ten Commandments given to Moses on Mount Sinai, and the sanctification of the law and of the prophets and scriptures promulgated by the Holy Spirit, and let the divine names of the testament of God, the book of God, and the book of life, the knowledge of God, the wisdom of God, and of such like be commemorated. 
So if a sword be to be consecrated, we may remember out of the second of Maccabees, there was a sword sent from God to Judas Maccabeus, that he should destroy the children of Israel enemies. Also that in the prophets, take unto you two edged swords also in the gospel, coats being sold, swords must be bought. And in the history of David, an angel was seen hiding a bloody sword and many such like we shall find in the prophets and apocalypse as also the sacred names of the sword of God and the rod of God, the staff of God, the vengeance of God and such like. And now let these things, which have been exemplified concerning real consecrations and benedictions, suffice, by which personal consecrations and benedictions may easily be understood. But there is yet another powerful and efficacious rite of consecrating and expiating, which is of the kinds of superstitious. Viz, when the rite of any sacrament is transumed to another thing, which is intended to be consecrated or expiated, as the rite of baptism, confirmation, funeral, and such like. Moreover, we must know that a vow, oblation, and sacrifice have a certain power of consecration, as well, real as personal, as the things or persons are vowed or offered. Chapter 63 what things may be called holy, what consecrated, and how these become so between us and the deities and of sacred times. Now those things are called sacred, which are made holy by the gods themselves, or their demons being, as I may say, dedicated to us by the gods themselves. By this account, we call demons holy, because in them God dwells, whose name they are often said to hear, whence it is read in Exodus. I will send my angel, who shall go before thee. Observe him, neither think that he is to be despised, because my name is in him. So also mysteries are called sacred, for a mystery is that which hath a holy and an occult virtue, and favor given by the gods or demons, or dispensed by the most high God himself. Such are those sacred names and characters which have been spoken of, so the cross is called holy and mysterious, being made so by the passion of Jesus Christ. Hence also certain prayers are called holy and mystical, which are not instituted by the devotion of man, but by divine revelation, as we read in the gospel that Christ instituted the Lord's prayer. In like manner, certain confections are called holy, into which God hath put the especial beam of his virtue, as we read in Exodus of the sweet perfume, and oil of anointing, and as with us there is a sacred fountain and a sacred ointment, there is also another kind of holiness, whereby we call those things holy which are dedicated and consecrated by man to God, as vows and sacrifices, of which we have spoken already. Whence Virgil, but Caesar with a triple triumph brought into the city of Rome as most devout, did dedicate unto the Italian gods an immortal vow. And Ovid in his Metamorphosis sings thus, A feast was kept wherein Aesides for Cisnus' death with heifer's blood did please, propitious Pallas, when the entrails laid on burning altars to the gods conveyed, an acceptable smell, a part addressed, to sacred use, the board received the rest. In like manner, the representations, resemblances, idols, statues, images, pictures, made after the similitudes of the gods, or dedicated to them, are called sacred, even as Orpheus sings in his hymn to Lycian Venus. The chieftains that the sacred things protect of our country did for our town erect a sacred statue, and Virgil. Hence divine Plato, in his eleventh book of laws, commanded that the sacred images and statues of the gods should be honored, not for themselves, but because they represent the gods to us. Even as the ancients did worship that image of Jupiter, thus interpreting it, for in that he bears the resemblance of man, was signified that he is a mind which produces all things by his seminary power. He is feigned to sit, that his immutable and constant power might be expressed. He hath the upper parts bare and naked, because he is manifest to the intelligences and the superiors, but the lower parts are covered, because he is hid from the inferior creatures. He holds a scepter in his left hand, because in these parts of the body the most spiritual habitation of life is found, for the creator of the intellect is the king, and the vivifying spirit of the world. But in his right hand he holds forth both an eagle and a victory." 
the one because he is lord of all the gods, as the eagle is of other birds, the other because all things are subject to him. In like manner, we also reverence the image of a lamb because it represents Christ, and the picture of a dove because it signifies the Holy Ghost, and the form of a lion, ox, eagle, and a man signifying the evangelists, and such like things which we find expressed in the revelations of the prophets and in diverse places of the Holy Scripture. Moreover, those things confer to the like revelations and dreams, and therefore are called sacred pictures. There are also sacred rites and holy observations, which are made for the reverencing of the gods and religion. These devout gestures, genuflexions, uncoverings of the head, washings, sprinklings of holy water, perfumes, exterior expiations, humble processions, and exterior ornaments for divine praises, as musical harmony, burning of wax candles and lights, ringing of bells, the adorning of temples, altars, and images, in all which there is required a supreme and special reverence and comeliness. Wherefore, there are used for these things the most excellent, most beautiful, and precious things, as gold, silver, precious stores, and such like, which reverences and exterior rites are, as it were, lessons and invitations to spiritual sacred things, for the obtaining the bounty of the gods concerning which Prosperina beareth witness in these verses. Whoever did the brazen statues slight, the yellow gifts of gold or silver white, who would not wonder and not say that these are of the gods, the priests also are called sacred, and the ministers of the divine powers and gods, and they themselves, being consecrated, do both administer all the holy things, and also consecrate them, whence Lucan, the consecrated priests to whom great power is granted, and Virgil, and of Hellenus, the priest of Apollo, he prays for peace of the gods, and doth unloose the garlands of his sacred head. Those holy rites are, as it were, certain agreements between the gods and us, exhibited with praise, reverence, or obedience, by the means of which we very oft obtain some wonderful virtue from that divine power on whom such reverence is bestowed. So there are sacred hymns, sermons, exorcisms, incantations, and words which are compounded and dedicated for the praises and divine services of the gods, whence Orpheus, in a verse composed for the stars, said, With holy words, now on the gods I call. And the primitive church did use certain holy incantations against diseases and tempests, which we either pronounce praying to some divine powers, or also sometimes carrying them along with us, written and hanging on our neck, or bound to us, we obtain very oft some power from such a saint, which men very much admire. By this means also there are sacred names, figures, characters, and seals, which contemplative men, in purity of mind, for their secret vows, have devoted, dedicated, and consecrated to the worship of God, which things truly, if any man afterwards shall pronounce with the same purity of mind, with the which they were first instituted, he shall in like manner do miracles." Further also, the manner and rules delivered by the first institutor must be observed, for they who are ignored of these things lose their labor and work in vain, thus not only by barbarous words, but also by Hebrews, Egyptian, Greek, Latin, and the names of other languages being devoted to God, and attributed and dedicated to his essence, power, operation. We sometimes do wonder such names— there are in Iamblichus, Viz, Osiris, Icton, Ameph, Tha, Epis, Amun, so in Plato and amongst the Greeks. Note, here in the text there are Greek characters which will be referred to, for the purpose of this recording, as this. You can see the full text at MidwestCovenCast.com under Podcast Extras Season 2. This. This. So the Greeks called Jupiter this, which signifies to live, because he gives life to all things. In like manner this, which signifies through, because through him are all things made. So this, which signifies immortal. So amongst the Latins he is called Jupiter, as it were an adjuvant father, and such like. And also certain names are devoted to men, as Eutychus, Sophia, Theophilus, 
that is, prosperous, servant, dear to God. In like manner, certain material things receive no little sanctity and virtue by consecration, especially if done by a priest, as we see those waxen seals in which are imprinted the figure of lambs to receive virtue by the benediction of the Roman high priest against lightnings and tempests that they cannot hurt those who carry them, for divine virtue is inspired into images, thus consecrated, and is contained in them, as it were, in a certain sacred letter, which hath the image of God, the like virtue, whose holy waxed lights receive at Easter. And at the feast of the purification of the virgins, in like manner, bells by consecration and benediction receive virtue, that they drive away and restrain lightnings and tempests, that they hurt not in those places where their sounds are heard. In like manner, salt and water, by their benedictions and exorcisms, receive power to chase and drive away evil spirits. And thus, in things of this kind, there are also sacred times always observed by the nations of every religion, with very great reverence, which are either commanded that we should sanctify by the gods themselves, or are dedicated to them by our forefathers and elders for the commemoration of some benefit received of the gods and for a perpetual thanksgiving thus the hebrews have received their sabbaths and the heathens their holy days and we the solemn days of our holy rites always to be reverenced with the highest solemnity there are also times contrary to these which they call penitential and we black days because that in those days the commonwealth hath suffered some notable blow and calamity of which sort amongst the romans was the day before the fourth nones of august because that on that day they suffered that extraordinary blow at the battle of cana in like manner all postriduan days are called black days because that most commonly battles succeed ill on these days. So amongst the Jews, the black days are the 17th day of June, because on that day Moses break the tables, Manassas erected an idol in the sanctum sanctorum, and the walls of Jerusalem are supposed to have been pulled down by their enemies. Likewise, the 9th of July is a black day with them, because on that day the destruction of both the temples happened. By this reason, they are called Egyptian days, in the old time observed by the Egyptians, and every nation by this way may easily make a like calculation of days fortunate or unfortunate to them, and the magicians command that these holy and religious days be observed no less than the planetary days and the celestial dispositions, for they affirm that they are far more efficacious, especially to obtain spiritual and divine virtues, because that their virtue is not from the elements and celestial bodies, but descends from the intelligible and super-celestial world, and being helped by the common suffrages of the saints, is not infringed by any adverse disposition of the heavenly body, nor frustrated by the corruptible contagion of the elements. If so be that firm belief and religious worship be not wanting, that is, joined with fear and trembling, for religion properly holds forth thus much, hence those days are called religious, which to violate is a sin, which if we carefully observe, we fear not any great mischief, which we may do if we do otherwise. Chapter 64 of certain religious observations, ceremonies, and rites of perfumings, unctions, and such like. Whosoever, therefore, thou art, who desires to operate in this faculty, in the first place implore God the Father, being one, that thou also may be one worthy of his favor, be clean within and without, in a clean place, because it is written in Leviticus, every man who shall approach those things which are consecrated, in whom there is uncleanness, shall perish before the Lord. Therefore, wash yourselves often, and at the days appointed according to the mysteries of number. Put on clean clothes, and abstain from all uncleanness, pollution, and lust. For the gods will not hear the man, as Porphyry said, who hath not abstained many days from venereous acts. Be not thou coupled to a polluted or menstruous woman, neither to her who hath the hemorrhoids. Touch not an unclean thing, nor a carcass. Whence Porphyry said, Whosoever shall touch a dead man may not approach the oracles, perhaps because that by a certain affinity of the funeral ill odor the mind is corrupted and made unfit to receive divine influences. Thou shalt wash and anoint and perfume thyself, and shalt offer 
sacrifices, for God accepts for a most sweet odor those things which are offered to him by a man purified and well disposed, and together with that perfume condescends to your prayer and oblation, as the psalmist sings, Let my prayer, O Lord, be directed to thee as incense in thy sight. Moreover, the soul, being the offspring and image of God himself, is delighted in these perfumes and odors, receiving them by those nostrils, by the which itself also entered into the corporeal man, and by the which, as Job testifies, the most lively spirits are sometimes sent forth, which cannot be retained in man's heart, boiling either through collar or labor, whence some think that the faculty of smelling is the most lively and spiritual of all the senses." further perfumes sacrifice and unction penetrate all things and open the gates of the elements and of the heavens and that through them a man can see the secrets of god heavenly things and those things which are above the heavens and also those which descend from the heavens as angels and spirits of deep pits and profound places apparitions of desert places and doth make them to come to you to appear visibly and obey you and they pacify all spirits and attract them as the lodestone iron and join them with the elements and cause the spirits to assume bodies for truly the spiritual body is very much encrusted by them and made more gross for it lives by vapors perfumes and the odors of sacrifices moreover whosoever thou operates do it with an earnest affection and hearty desire and the goodness of the heavens and heavenly bodies may favor thee and whose favor that thou may more easily obtain the fitness of the place time profession custom diet habit exercise and name also do wonderfully conduce for by these the power of nature is not only changed but also overcome for a fortunate place conduces much to favor neither without cause did the lord speak to abraham that he should come into the land which he would show him and abraham arose and journeyed towards the south in like manner isaac went to jeroroth where he sowed and gathered an hundredfold and waxed very rich but what place is congruous to each one must be found out by his nativity which thing he that knows not let him observe where his spirits are especially recreated where his senses are more lively where the health of his body and his strength is most vigorous where his businesses succeed best where most favor him where his enemies are overthrown let him know that this region this place is preordained by god and his angels for him and is also well disposed and prepared by the heavens therefore reverence this place and change it according to your time and business but always fly an unfortunate place fortunate names also make things more fortunate but unfortunate unhappy hence the romans in lifting their soldiers were weary lest that the first soldiers names should be in any measure unfortunate and for paying tributaries and musterings of their armies and colonies they did choose censors with good names moreover they believed that if unfortunate names were changed into fortunate that the fortune of things would also be changed into better so epidemus least the seaman going that they should suffer damage they commanded to be called diarachius for the same cause they called maliaton lest he should cause some mischief beneventus but they thought good to call lacus or lucrinus for the goodness of the name being the most happy place of all make election also of hours and days for the operations for not without cause our saviour spoke are there not twelve hours in the day and so forth for the astrologers teach that time can give a certain fortune to our businesses the magicians likewise have observed and to conclude all the ancient wise men consent in this that it is of very great concernment that in that moment of time and disposition of the heavens everything whether natural or artificial hath received its being in this world for they have delivered that the first moment hath so great power that all of the course of fortune depends thereon and may be foretold thereby and in like manner by the successes of the fortune of everything they both firmly believed and experience also testifies that the beginning of anything may thereby be found out even as sulla the astrologian foretold that a most certain destruction approached caligula who asked him advice concerning his nature 
Methian, the astrologer, foresaw the calamity of the wars, which happened afterward, and the Athenians, making an expedition against the Syracusians, to the same about to sail to Sicilia. Messen, the astrologer, foretold a great tempest, and Naxagoras, by the knowledge of the times, forewarned on what days a great stone should fall from the sun, as afterward it happened at Agos, a river of Thracia. On the contrary, L. Tarnusius Firmianus, by the acts of the fortune of Romulus, found both the time of his conception and nativity. The same man found out also the nativity of the city of Rome, by making the successes and fortunes of that city. So Maternus reports that the beginning and creation, even of this world, was found out by the events of things, for that times can do very much in natural things, may be manifested by many examples, for there are trees which after the solstice do invert their leaves, as the poplar, elm, olive, lintree, white willow, and shellfishes, crabs, and oysters do encase, the moon increasing, and then the moon decreases, do grow lean, and the seas, in ebbing and flowing, do observe the motions and times of the moon, and Europus, in Euboea, doth it not seven times with wonderful swiftness, ebb and flow, and three days in every month, viz. the seven, eight, and nine, day of the moon, it stands still, and amongst the troglodytes there is a lake, which thrice in a day is made bitter and salt, and again sweet. Moreover, in the winter time, when all things wither and dry, pennyroyal flourishes. On the same day, they say that blown bladders do break, and that the leaves of sallows and pomegranates are turned and forced about, and it's known to all that which I have seen both in France and Italy, and I know also the sowing thereof, viz. that a nut tree, which seems dry all the year, on the eve of St. John's Day, doth produce both leaves and flowers, and ripe fruits, and this miracle doth wholly consist in the observation of the time of its sowing. Moreover, that times can yield some wonderful power to artificial things. The astrologers in their books of elections and images do constantly affirm, and by this means we read in Plutarch, that there was an image amongst the Polinians made with such art, that what way soever it did look, it did strike all things with terror and very great perturbations, so that no man durst through fear behold it. And we read in the life of Apollonius that the magicians of Babylon had tied to the roof of their house four golden fowls, which they called the tongues of the gods, and that they had power to reconcile the minds of the multitude to the love and obedience of the king. In the island Chios there was the face of Diana placed on high, whose countenance appeared sad to those which came in, but to those that went out it appeared cheerful. In Troas, the sacrifices which were left about the image of Minerva did not putrefy. In the temple of Venus at Paphos, it never reigned in the court. If anything was taken forth from the tomb of Antheus, showers were poured down from heaven till that which was dug up was restored into its place. In the tomb of King Bibria Pontus did arise a laurel from which, if any one did break a branch and carry it on shipboard, quarrels would never cease until it was thrown over. In the island Borsenes, no bird did haunt the house of Achilles. At Rome, neither fly nor dog did enter into the palace of Hercules. In the ox market, in Olynthus of Thracia, there was a place into the which, if a beetle had fallen, it could not get forth, but writhing itself every way it died." I could bring even innumerable examples, and far more wonderful than these, which antiquity reports to have been done by the art of images, and by the observation of times. But least anyone should think them long since obsolete, and repute them for fables, I will bring more new things, and such as remain even to this time in some places, and I will join to these some artificial wonders." For they say that the art of images, it cometh to pass, that at Byzantine serpents hurt not, and that jackdaws fly not over within the walls, that in Crete there are no night owls, that about Naples grasshoppers are never heard, that at Venice no kind of fly doth enter the public houses of barbers, that in Toledo, in the public shambles, one only fly is seen all the year long of a notable whiteness." 
and we in the foregoing book have declared already both the fashions and times by the observation of which these things and such like may be done moreover you ought especially to observe the virtues of speeches and words for by these the soul is spread forth into inferior substances into stones metals plants animals and all natural things imprinting diverse figures and passions on them enforcing all creatures or leading and drawing them up a certain affection so cato testifies that weary oxen are refreshed by words and also that by prayers and words you may obtain of tellus that it produce unusual trees trees also may by this means be entered to pass over to another place and to grow in another ground rapes grow the greater if they be entreated when they are sown to be beneficial to them their family and neighbors the peacock also being commended presently extends his feathers but on the contrary it is found by experience that the herb basil being sown with cursings and railings is more flourishing also a kind of lobster doth cure burnings and scaldings if so be that in the meantime his name be not named Further, they which use witchcraft kill trees by praising them, and thus do hurt sown corn and children. Moreover, they say that there is so great power in man's execrations that they chase and banish even wicked spirits. Eusebius declares that by this means Serapis, amongst the Egyptians, did publish short sentences by the which devils were expelled and he taught also how devils having assumed the forms of brute beasts do ensnare men to conclude in all businesses put god before your eyes for it is written in deuteronomy when you shall seek the lord your god you shall find him once we read in mark that whatsoever ye shall desire and pray for believing that you shall receive it it shall come to pass for you and in matthew if you shall have faith as a grain of mustard seed, nothing shall be impossible for you. Also, the fervent prayer of a righteous man prevails much. For Elias, as James said, was a man like unto us, subject unto passions. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain upon the earth, and it rained not in three years and six months. And again he prayed that the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth its fruit, but take heed in your prayers, lest that you should desire some vain thing, or that which is against the will of God, or God would have all things good, neither shalt thou use the name of thy God in vain, for he shall not go unpunished, who takes his name for a vain thing. Be abstemious, and give alms. For the angel said to Tobiah, Prayer is good, with fasting and alms. And we read in the book of Judith, Know ye that the Lord will hear your prayers, if ye shall preserve in fastings and prayers in his sight. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Midwest Covencast Presents Weekend Reads. Join us next time as we continue through Heinrich Cornelius Agrippa's Three Books of Occult Philosophy or Magic, Book 3, Ceremonial Magic. To access podcast extras and so much more, you can visit MidwestCovencast.com. Otherwise, I hope you will visit us on social media at Midwest Coven Cast on TikTok, Facebook, and Instagram, and at Midwest Coven on Twitter. Until next time, Coven, blessed be.